For this video, we're going to be looking at the create question and looking at the fill in multiple blanks and fill in the blank question types. And they're pretty similar. Uh, really, the, the main key difference is that when you have a single fill in the blank question, you have to ask your question first, and then the text field where the user types their answer, it's going to automatically appear in a text box after the question, so right in this space right here. And you have no control over that. You can't insert it before, you can't insert it in the middle, it's going to always be after the actual question. And here's that example right there. So here's our question, and then this is the text box where the user would input their answer. This is in contrast to if you create a question where you have multiple fill in the blanks. This is where the variables in our square brackets come into play, a lot like we were making a jumbled sentence. But unlike a jumbled sentence, with this option, we do have the option of creating individualized feedback for every single correct or incorrect answer for each individual part. And so we've got five text boxes here, A, B, C, D, and E, and you can choose where you want a text box to be just by typing the square brackets and a unique letter anywhere in your question. And you can have as many as you want within reason, of course. And then what th this looks like in test format would be this question right down here. So we have all of these text boxes of the same width, and you cannot really change the width yourself. So do keep that in mind if you are trying to make them type a long answer. Those long answers would be better suited for a short response or short essay, not a small text box like this. But because we're looking for individual pieces of information, the text boxes here work really quite well. And it's nice that you can have as many of these as you want, and you can specify exactly where in your question they appear. So when you go to create a question, if we go to a fill in the blank and make a new one, or come down to our already made one and go over here to our question and then edit this question, what you're going to have is you have your title, you have your question description, and then remember, because this is a single fill in the blank, your text box is going to appear in this space right after whatever you type, and you cannot control that. And then for the answers, how many possible answers are we going to choose? Now you have these options for each text box, so whether it's a single fill in the blank or multiple, each answer is going to have this similar format, where you're going to have a correct response and then an incorrect response, and then some, uh, some notes as well as to why you are creating this question and your learning goals. Now these answers can get kind of tricky because you'll notice that we can have more than one possible answer up to a maximum of 100 and for each answer we can make them choose either an exact match and then we can optionally enforce case sensitive uh, matching or we can have a contains so as long as their answer contains orange or maybe orange we will count their answer as being correct The last option for a pattern match, this is where things can get really complicated very fast. And so I would strongly encourage you to not even bother with this yet until you're more used to making tests in Blackboard and some of the other options. Because what the pattern match wants you to do is it wants you to use these different symbols in your answers to look for patterns or wild cards. And they can be hard to work with when this is your first time doing anything of the sort. So I would just leave pattern match alone for now and stick with questions that will allow you to either have a exact match or a contains match. In contrast, if you go to create a question and go to fill in multiple blanks, or go to a multiple blank question and edit it, this is already made for you guys as the example, we have the same thing, our title and our question text, but in our question text we're actually able to determine where a text box is going to be. And however many of these variables you insert, we will automatically create the same number of answers on the next page that you get to by clicking on the next button at the top or the bottom. And then 
for the options, because we do have multiple answers as part of a single question, we can choose to allow partial credit or not. Now, why might you not want to allow partial? Well, if you're working with a process where you have to understand every single step in sequence, or something can break or someone might die, that would be a good situation where they have to get everything correct or nothing is correct. But chances are most of your questions are not going to be in those extreme situations. But again, the option of allowing partial is ultimately up to you, and this is where you toggle that option. Now once you have your question and the total number of text fields you want them to be able to type as part of this question, we're going to go ahead to the next button here. And same idea, we have for every single text box, we can choose how many answers will qualify for that text box. And for each answer, we can choose an exact match, a contains, or, and again, I suggest you don't do this, a pattern match, unless you know what you're doing. So contains or exact match should probably be your main options here. And the reason why you do contains or pattern is if you know or if you see that students are constantly having the correct answer, but maybe they're mistyping it or misfilling it. My rationale, however, is that since this is college, you should be able to spell things correctly or have it marked wrong, but that's just me. And again, uh, because of my question settings, I've enabled individual feedback. Because we have multiple answers, we are able to have a correct response or an incorrect response for each individual answer on top of an overall incorrect and incorrect response for the answer as a, as a collective. So for number two, uh, we get, get an exact match, so Alaska. It's not case sensitive, even though I could make it so, because it is a state, proper noun. Um, so number C, exact match, because it's a year. Number D, I have contains, because the question is, what or who was Alaska's first governor? And they could have Bill Egan, William Egan, his full name. Really what's important is his last name. So as long as they contain his last name in the answer, it's going to be marked as correct. And then again for number E, an exact match because we're looking for a town. And again, if I wanted to enforce case sensitive responses, I would check this box since the town of Valdez, as they say locally, is a proper town. And so it should be capitalized. And again, for every single text box, you have the answer, or you have the option of choosing multiple answers that might fit there. That's pretty much all there is as far as those two types of questions are concerned.